Welcome to Shupak Sports. I'm Marty Shupak, and this is the baseball and softball practice template number seven. We've had six previous. We've also done uh, a number in about seven for T-ball. I try to keep it under 20 minutes. I go through it fairly quick with the drills. I start to overlap drills. It might seem a little redundant, but there's a reason if I do it because the drills worked. Please make sure you subs subscribe to the Shoepack Sports channel. I'm going to be giving you a lot of information. It's all free. When you subscribe, you'll be notified when a new template is up. I'll be getting into strategies later on leading up to the season. Uh, before we start, I'd like to ask a trivia. I love trivia, as I tell you every time. I'm not the best at it, but I enjoy it. While this is uh, being filmed, it's right around World Series time. So I dug in and I came up with a World Series question. Here we go. Who holds the record for most innings pitched in a single World Series game? I'm going to give you four choices. Here we go. Who holds the record for most innings pitched in a single World Series game? Was it Cy Young? Was it Babe Ruth? He was a pitcher. Was it Sandy Koufax? Or was it Whitey Ford? Okay, we'll come back to that at the end. In this particular practice, we go through the typical warm-up, and keep in mind, the warm-up is essential, especially the older the kids get, it becomes more and more essential. And I'm, I've mentioned it before, they've done studies that it can prevent injuries, even at the youngest age. Any sort of quick warm-up, running around the bases, um, doing jumping jacks, arm rotations, it's always good if the coaches will jog around like the infield with the players. They like to see that, okay? After the warm-up, uh, we do one of my favorites. If you've seen this before, the third base drill. Keep in mind, when you do the third base drill, first of all, as I always mention, there's usually like four people at each base, home, third, and first. Okay, I'm hitting ground balls or throwing them. There's nothing wrong if you can't hit like fungo ground balls and you're more comfortable throwing them, throw them. But if you do throw them, always keep one or two extra in the glove because as they throw it to first base, I want the next ball out, okay, either for this player or if he goes to the end of the line for the next one in line. You want to keep this moving, this drill, all right? And on the last ground ball, I always yell out bobble drill. And if you remember what this is doing, it's conditioning the players where they pick the ball up, they drop it, and they pick it up, then they throw to first base. We're doing some conditioning where if the player bobbles the ball, they still have a chance to make the play. We want players to learn not to give up on a ground ball. We want to have them try to feel the ground ball in the center of their body. Young kids have a tendency to reach for the ball with their glove hand. All right, I'm actually lefty, so I'll be reaching with my right hand. Okay, sometimes you have to reach, you can't help it, but we want to get players used to moving their feet. In this particular drill, as we move on in the season, I start to hit it to each side of them, to the shortstop side and to the third base side. Now, this isn't showing a true position where they are. They're almost in the middle, shaded a little towards third base. Also on first base, when they're throw it there. I usually have two players and they rotate every three or four throws. Okay. And when I yell rotate, they go clockwise. Goes quick. A lot of repetitions. Okay. That's the third base drill. Next drill is another one of my favorites, which if you've been here before, I'll show it to you again. It's the line throw drill where I line up balls at shortstop and third. I stand right around here, and I first point 
to short the shortstop, Ayo Gull. He runs, picks it up, throws it to first base. Now he goes to the end of the third base line. Okay. Again, a lot of repetitions. If your team is very young, what you might want to do is just have one line and one line of baseballs. Okay. You won't get as many repetitions as when you have two lines, but it's a good way to initiate the players into this drill and build on from that. The one thing I want to mention too is when you're doing these drills, okay, a lot of times you save time when you transition from one drill to another. One of the reasons why I like these two drills they're both in a confined infield area. So if I'm doing the third base drill first, and then I'm doing the line throw, the players are already there. And I could yell to the players, uh, players that are at third base, go to the shortstop position, players at home, go to the third base. And then I split up the other players that are at first base. Again, this is not shown a really realistic view. There are usually 12 players on a team, four at each spot. But as they go into their positions, myself or an assistant coach is lining up the baseballs over here. Again, my practices are very short. A lot of times for 10, 11, and 12, they're no longer than 75 minutes to 90 minutes. I don't waste a lot of time, okay? So those are the two drills after the warm-up, and those are kind of warm-up drills. I don't like to really have my players throw long distances as their first throws, okay? If you're going to do um, like the, the long throws the pitchers do, uh, I would start with the short throws first. After that... <laughs> I do a drill called hit the cutoff. Now this is just showing positions where the player should go. And it looks like it's a ball hit to right field, no one on base. All right, I'll hold it a little closer. But you as a coach, and especially you travel ball coaches, depends how competitive you are. I've changed it around. I don't go by the book sometimes. One time I had a first baseman who was like six inches tall and every player in the team. He was 12 years old. You'd swear he was 14 or 15. I instructed him to go to the top of the pitcher's mound. I want him to be the cutoff because I know if he cut it off and he turned to make a throw, we had a shot at it. All right. But Teaching the cutoffs is good. And this, again, is showing you ball hit the right field. And you want to have him practice hitting the cutoff. And you have the second baseman go out. He lines up with the shortstop. What I also practice is, and again, I do different scenarios. You don't want to give the kids too much at one time. So if you're practicing the cutoffs, and this is hitting the ball to right field, no one on base, then you might want to practice hitting the ball to left field, no one on base, and hitting the ball to right field with a player on second. That's it. Do those three, okay? If you do too many at practice, it's all going to overlap. They're never going to understand it. Do those three. The next practice, start out with the same three, and then teach them three new cutoffs. Another thing I like to do is with hit the cutoff, I also like to practice missing the cutter. So I'll have a signal or I'll tell the player, let's say in right field, overthrow the cutoff man at second. See how the players react. As you know, in any sort of youth baseball game, mistakes happen every game. The team that makes the less mistakes and they throw the ball around uh, less than the other team has a better chance of winning. So in addition to practicing hit the cutoff, feel free to practice miss the cutoff, okay? All right. In my book, I have all the cutoffs and where they should be, but you can look it up on the internet. You don't have to go buy my book for that. All right. So that's another drill. Now, I also want to mention a, um, a little advanced tip before we get to the next drill. When I was 
a younger coach, I was passionate about baseball and softball drills. I would make up drills, three, four, or five drills a week. I found I was rushing through practice from one drill to the next because I was so passionate about trying my new drill. I was a little mistaken. And the reason being, I learned quickly that when you have a chance in your practices for a teaching moment, take the time and teach the players that teaching moment, whether it's something that might happen in a game or that has happened in a game already, okay? Again, you don't want to do too much, but don't overlook a good teaching moment when you're in practice if it happens to come up, all right? Okay, here's another drill. It's kind of a fun drill. I think I've showed it to you before. It's the called the um, rapid throw drill. I divide the team in pairs, try to match it up by ability. You don't, don't want to have the two best players. They're spread out a little bit. They each, each pair each has a ball on this side. And on the go command, I time it 10 seconds. They throw it back and forth as fast as they could. At the end of 10 seconds, I yell stop. I yell go to start and yell stop uh, when it's over. And then I go down the line and say, how many times did you throw the ball? How many times? How many times? And they're on the honor system. All right. And usually they always tell the truth. And it's a competition. And then on the next round, we move this line back like five feet or 10 feet. And again, on the go command, I might increase it to like, 15 seconds, yell go, and they go back and forth to each other. Then I yell stop. Two things. This is just a picture, but you really have to spread them out. It doesn't show them spread out enough, okay? Um, and actually three things, a few things. You'll see in this drill, when the players do it correctly and they catch the ball and they, they take it out of glove and throw it, their footwork becomes automatic. And not only does it become automatic, it comes automatic, the correct way of doing it. You'll see what happens. It's really amazing when they start doing it correctly and they learn that with the proper footwork and to transfer the ball, they can get out of their glove quicker. The other thing I do in this drill, I'll give each pair an extra board to put, put at the feet of uh, one of the pairs of the players. And what that is, it's a second chance. So let's say if uh, this pair on the third throw, he throws it overhead, I just yell out, leave it, use the backup ball. All right. You're giving players a chance. They enjoy this drill. It's a great drill. It's a great way to um, really follow a skill session like hit the cutoffs. You want to integrate, again, skill drills with fun drills. It's the formula I use for 30 years, and I'm telling you, it works. If you have a better formula, you use it. If you think kids will have a good time at practice, if you think it'll work and your team will win more games, you do what's best for your team, but I'm telling you what worked for my team. I integrated skill drills with fun drills. And a lot of the drills, the kids couldn't wait for more. All right. After that, I came up with a drill. It's a batting drill. And it's called the continuation drill. And what I do is, and as you know, when I do batting practice, as the kids come into uh, practice, I give them a number. That's the way they bat. I do the same thing here. And this is how the continuation drill works. Okay. The player that, that's at bat, he stays at bat as long as he hits, number one, he hits the ball fair. Number two, it's not caught on a fly. Number three, it's a fair ball. Okay. And they go up to, they can stay up there for five swings. And what I'm doing is I'm conditioning the players. And during games, I'd yell out continuation drill. And they'll cut down on the swing and they'll just meet the ball and they'll hit ground balls, which is what we want. As you may or may not know, ground balls will yield more hits than balls in the air. But 
What I do is when they have a number, I usually put the on deck and double on deck batter there. I keep two or three balls in my glove and I'm throwing fairly quickly. They're set. If they swing and miss, I yell next. He gets out of the batter's box. Next one comes in. He's got to go around and take a spot in the field. If it's a fly ball and they catch the ball, I yell next. If the player stays up and hits a ground ball, 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 ball, he's got five chances. You could set this up as a competition. Kids love competition, okay? But make sure you limit the number of times they can hit the ground balls. And the other thing is they have to take a full swing. No half swings or full swings. This works. And if you do this and the kids are getting it, when you have games and a player has two strikes, yell out continuation drill. He's conditioned, hit the ball on the ground, just meet the ball. It works. And then we end up with our batting practice, of which I've been promising a new picture. I apologize. I haven't gotten to it. Keep in mind, just to review, I set up two cones. The first two pitches, they have to bunt. If it goes between the cone, you can hit the cone, they get an extra swing. So if I'm giving the players seven swings and a player hits two balls through the cone or bunts them, he gets nine swings. I have a on-deck batter and a double on-deck batter. They're doing the hitting the ball off the tee and the toss drill with an assistant coach. I have an empty bucket here, an empty bucket at second. I tell players to roll the ball to the bucket. No run the last one out. This is batting practice. It's not fielding practice. No, they're getting practice in the field and it's not base running practice. Okay. This method will yield your team between 25 and 40% more swings than a regular team's batting practice. I promise you. And they'll become better bunters. The other thing is if you have an L screen, put it up. You don't want to get hurt. Move it to the move to the base of the mound. You'll throw more strikes, and that's how we end practice. And that is the template number seven. Uh, as far as products, I urge you to pick up this book. I've been promoting it again. I don't like to ask you to buy my books. Go to the library, ask for them. But this is a book baseball coach and a guide for the youth coach and parent that if you're just getting to coaching, you will use it. It has 60 sample practices and over 300 pictures. Okay. And um, another book. All right. Here we go. If you have a nine or 10, 11, 12 year old child, you could try this book. Playoff Fever and Split Pants. It's a young adult book. I've had adults read it. It's gotten very good reviews. Your son or daughter will love this book. I promise you that. Okay. All right. Now we're going to close this out. Again, make sure you subscribe, please. And uh, give me a thumbs up if you could. And like this thing and everything else. And share with your friends, with your enemies, with your leagues. Anyone else that can help uh, this um, a YouTube channel. I want to keep the format going. I want to keep it for free. Back to the trivia question. Who holds the record for the most innings pitched in a single World Series game? Was it Cy Young? Was it Babe Ruth? Was it Sandy Koufax? Was it Whitey Ford? Here we go. All right. The answer is Babe Ruth. In game two of the 1916 World Series, Babe Ruth pitched a 14-inning complete game, beating the Dodgers 2-1. to one. So that just shows you how diverse – the babe was okay. All right, for shoe pack sports. By the way, I'm going to put a, a link down there where I did a short video on how to break in a glove. It's free of charge. If you're going to get a, a glove for your son and daughter, you might want to look at it. Uh, I just put together some different ideas I got from different companies, and it might save you a lot of time and money. For shoe pack sports, this has been Marty Shoe Pack. Thank you for viewing. Until next time.